We are continuing with our lesson on the axial skeleton. In the previous lecture, we went and talked all the way about through the skull. So now we're moving on from the skull to the vertebral or vertebral column, and we're going to learn all the different aspects of that. The vertebral column in an adult is going to have curves to them. So it's not a straight up and down. So you can see from this lateral view, you have this first part here of the vertebral column that's going to go almost down, but it comes forward just a little bit. And then it comes back as it goes through the back area. And then it comes back in anteriorly. And then it goes right back out posteriorly when you get to the end of the sacrum and to the coccyx here. So as you're looking through these, your cervical vertebrae are going to be, of course, here. There are seven cervical vertebrae. This is what we refer to later as a secondary curve. So you have a little bit of curve where it's going anteriorly a bit. A primary curve is what they are born with. So an infant's going to come out and they have that primary curve. The secondary curve is going to come about as they start walking upright and having to hold their head. So the um, cervical curve with the cervical vertebrae is going to be a secondary curve and it de develops as the infant is learning to hold themselves upright and to start walking and it is going to move the head in a way so that it's going to balance out the weight of the body so that they're able to walk upright. The thoracic curve is going to be a primary curve. It's really important to go backwards like this because, of course, we have our heart and our lungs sitting in that area as well as a bunch of blood vessels. So you need that big open space here. The lumbar curve is another secondary curve. So where our thoracic curve, we had 12 different thoracic vertebrae that are going through here that are curving posteriorly. We're going to go back anteriorly with our lumbar curve. The lumbar curve is going to have the five lumbar vertebrae. And again, this is a secondary one. And this is one that's going to develop as the babies are learning to walk. And again, it's going to help them balance their body to be upright. The sacral curve of our sacrum down here is going to be moving posterior until the coccyx is going to come forward again. And again, it's going to be there because we're providing space for those reproductive organs that are going to be held within the region of the pelvis. Now you can have just different disorder vertebral column. So kyphosis, you can see there's an exaggerated thoracic curve. So it's very exaggerated. This could happen because of osteoporosis, just degenerated over time. Um, having poor posture is also going to affect this sort of thing. So that's kyphosis or like a hunchback. Lordosis is an exaggerated lumbar curve. Pregnant women are oftentimes going to um, suffer from this because the belly is going to be larger, throwing off their center of gravity. So one of the things that compensates is that their back is going to have that exaggerated lumbar curve to kind of mess with their center of gravity so they don't topple over with that new weight. And then you have scoliosis. Scoliosis is when you're going to have a horizontal movement of it. So you're not going to have the straight spine that you would normally see back here. Part of it is going to have this lateral movement in there. This is going to be um, detrimental because for one thing it's going to be quite uncomfortable, but it also is going to squish some of your organs one side or the other depending on how severe the scoliosis is. Um, a lot of scoliosis um, cases are not this serious, but if it's something serious like this, oftentimes they're going to have surgery and put things like a rod in there to kind of straighten out that area because it could have some um, lasting effects on the organs that are inside. But if you have slight scoliosis, they're really not going to do a whole lot with it. Now we mentioned all those vertebra are sitting on top of each other, creating this stack that's creating this vertebral or vertebral column. Let's look at the individual vertebra and the major parts that you're going to have, whether you're talking cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. You're going to have the vertebral body, which is going to be the main portion of the vertebra itself. And then you're going to have this big opening or space that's going to be in here. This space is where the spinal cord is going to be passing through. So very important to have that spinal cord space that's going to be in there. So that's going to be um, a big, large foramen that's going to allow that to happen. Then you will have at the top the vertebral arch, which is going over to allow that space. The little feet on either side of that arch are going to be referred to as the pedicles, so petty like foot. So these are little feet of that part. And then you're going to have a number of different processes, which are going to be these weird irregular structures that are coming outward from the vertebra itself. And that's going to depend on which vertebra you're talking about and how those processes are going to look. But you ha will have a bunch of articular processes. 
Now the lamina that you have is also going to be the actual bone section. So the bone that's creating this vertebral arch is referred to as the lamina. So the lamina is going to go around creating the top of the arch and then the pedicles are going to be going down forming the bottom where it's going to meet with the vertebral body. This is the spinous process. So when you look at someone's back and you run your finger down the end of it, these are the bumps that you're feeling right down the center of it. And it's the most prominent structure that you're going to see and you can actually generally see it through the skin. But notice you also have transverse processes coming on on either side of it. And you of course have your pedicles that are there, there as well. You're going to also have these processes where the vertebra are fitting in with each other. They kind of nest with each other. So this is an inferior view. So this is the bottom of it that you can see. When you stack them on top of each other, they are going to nest with the inferior part this process is going to meet with a superior process that's going to be on the vertebra that's directly underneath it. We will, of course, have an intervertebral disc right here. These intervertebral discs are going to be cushions because you don't want the vertebra having bone hitting bone. So you have this nice little squishy gel-like cushion between them. And then you can see these different articulating joints are touching each other. So they're actually going to physically touch, but they are going to be lined in this cartilage to make sure that you're not having bone grinding against bone. The area that you have in here where they're meeting each other, they're referred to as facets or um, facets, some people say. But they're articular facets where one bone is meeting with the other and they will glide against each other to allow just a little bit of movement. So here you can see here's an inferior facet or facet. We have a big opening where your spinal cord is going to be going through because you have that vertebral arch made up from your pedicle and then that's um, arch that's going around it to protect that. The spinal cord is an extension of your brain. So your brain is a very squishy material. Your spinal cord is the same. It's very squishy and we want to make sure that you're not compressing it, that you're not damaging it. So that's why you're going to have bone on either side of it that's going to be protecting it. Now looking specifically at the cervical vertebra, remember there are seven cervical vertebrae in here, each stacked on top of each other. C1 and C2 are going to be different than the other one, so we give them their own particular names. C1 is also referred to as your atlas, and your C2 is referred to as your axis. And so notice the axis is going to have this little projection that's sticking upward that is referred to as the dens. The dens is going to allow the atlas, the C1, to sit on top of it and then it will have a little ligament that's going to be holding it in place. The two fitting together like this gives you the motion of your head where you're able to go up and down to say yes or back and forth to say no. So that movement of your head where you're rotating is going to be possible because the fitting of the dens of the axis with the cervical vertebral one as well. Now with these vertebra, Notice that the spinal process is kind of pointing downward. So if you were to try to nest these together, generally your bigger ones are going to be towards the bottom and they start smaller to begin with, though the axis is going to be a little bit larger there. So but you can identify that through the dens. I'm not going to ask you to specifically know what C2, C, C3, C4, C5 are going to look like, but you should be able to identify C1 and C2. Now this is a nice table that's going to go over the three major types of vertebrae that you have and it gives you the number of them. You can see the basic differences on there though. So like for instance the lumbar, they are going to be much more stout and strong. They're going to be weight bearing. Um, so they're going to have a nice wide base to them. The thoracic, you can see how the um, transverse processes are kind of moving upward like this. That's because those are going to be points where your ribs are going to be attaching to it because this is your thoracic um, vertebra, part of your thoracic cage. And then of course you have your cervical, for cervical vertebra, which are going to be looking distinctly different than the thoracic or the lumbar. But you should be able to differentiate between the three major types. Now at the end, we're going to have our sacrum and our coccyx. These are going to form the backside of what we refer to as our pelvis. This is the only part of the pelvis, though, that is actually part of the axial skeleton. The rest of the hip bone that's going to be surrounding it is part of your appendicular skeleton. Now when we look at this, these are actually going to be fused vertebra that are put together. So this is a posterior view. You're seeing it from the um, back side of it. So you can see that there's a large ridge right here. We refer to that as our sacral crest. And then we have a bunch of little holes that are going to be in the sacrum itself. So as the vertebra fuse, they left these openings or holes that nerves are going to be running through. So those are foramina and their sacral foramina. 
as you get older, you'll see that these will fuse together. You start with five different individual vertebra, and then between your 20s and 30s, they will fuse together, and you can see the line that's gonna be produced as they are starting to fuse together. So those are referred to as transverse lines. Anywhere from three to five segments long, so it just depends on the individual, and they will generally fuse together by age 26. So one of the things you can do is, um, you can age a skeleton based on how fused their sacrum is gonna be as well as their coccyx. Um, those start fusing usually around puberty time, and then again, the mid 20s to 30s is when they're usually going to finish up fusing. Now the last part with our thoracic cage. Now the thoracic cage is going to of course have the ribs that are making it up, as well as the sternum that's holding it together, and of course they're going to attach to those transverse processes that we saw with the thoracic vertebra. So when we're looking at specifically in the breastbone, it's referred to as the sternum, the sternum has three major parts to it. You're gonna have the manubrium at the top, which is kind of a square piece, then the body is the main middle portion of it, and then the xiphoid process, which is gonna be the pointy section right at the bottom. You will have 12 pairs of ribs that are gonna be attached to that thoracic cage. Then you notice that those ribs themselves will have bands of cartilage that actually hold it to the sternum. Those are referred to as coastal or costal cartilages that are holding the bone in place. Of your ribs, you have two major sets. You will have your true ribs, and then you will have your false ribs. True ribs are gonna have a direct connection into the sternum itself. So you can see one through seven, they're going and they're binding directly right into the sternum. But when you look at eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, they'll either indirectly attach to the sternum or not at all. So for instance, 11 and 12 back here are gonna be on the posterior side, they're protecting your kidneys, but they don't actually come around and attach with any of these coastal cartilages. But you can see eight and nine here are coming around and they're kind of meeting at this one costal cartilage that they're sharing. Again, when you're looking at these bony structures and you're like, why this really weird shape, think of what it has to be attaching to it and what the function is going to be as to why it is that particular shape.